In our next series of lessons on protein function from Chapter 5, we want to look at some structural proteins, and we'll look first at the actin microfilament. So here we have listed the cytoskeletal or structural proteins that we'll look at in this chapter, and they're listed in order of increasing size. So first we have microfilaments composed of actin, that's about 70 angstroms. And then at about 100 angstroms are the intermediate filaments, and we'll be looking particularly at keratin and collagen. And then lastly, the largest are the microtubules composed of tubulin, about 240 angstroms. It's not important that you remember the numbers, just remember their relative size. So in this illustration from your book on the bottom right, where these three types of structural proteins have been stained with different fluorescent tags, you can see that they localize to different areas within the cell, and this relates to their function. So we'll look first at the structure and then see how that relates to their biological function. So let's look at that actin microfilament. There are actually two forms. There's G-actin, or globular actin, and that's pictured on the bottom left here. You can see it's kind of globular in shape, kind of uh, like a cupped hand in one form. Can you see that secondary structure, the alpha helices and beta strands? Of course, this globular shape, that tells us the tertiary structure. And you'll notice at the palm or the bottom of that hand, there's an ATP molecule in green here. So this is an ATP binding protein. And what we'll see is that ATP plays a chemical and an energetic role. We'll look at that in just a moment. So this is one form, G-actin. It assembles, these monomers assemble to form a filament. That's filamentous actin, or F-actin, and that's pictured on the right here. The different colors of the subunits are just to help you see it a little bit better how that's arranged in three-dimensional space. So what we're looking at with F-actin, of course, is the quaternary structure, because we're talking about multiple subunits. So it's a double chain of subunits, and we find it has a minus end and a plus end. We'll talk about what that means in just a moment, but it is not a matter of charge. Now I've labeled the same ends in G actin, so you can see a little bit better how they assemble together. So what we're calling the minus end, that's where ATP binds, and the plus end is the other end. And so as they assemble, a minus end that carries ATP binds with a plus end that does not carry ATP. So what do we mean by that plus and minus end? Well, it simply means that it grows more rapidly at one end than it does the other. So it grows more rapidly at the plus end than it does at the minus end. We know this from fluorescent studies. And this assembly into the filament is driven by ATP hydrolysis. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But that's a, a way of releasing energy. Now we say it's catalyzed that is this ATP hydrolysis, is catalyzed by F-actin, not the monomer. All that tells us is simply that the ATP is hydrolyzed after it assembles into the filament, not before. So in other words, we're not going to take G-actin, hydrolyze ATP, and then assemble with the filament. We're going to assemble with the filament first, and then ATP is hydrolyzed. So if we were to look at an end where we had just added one of the monomers, it would still be bound to ATP. However, an older end would be bound to ADP. We've lost a phosphate through ATP hydrolysis. So let's look at that ATP hydrolysis a little bit. Just remember, whenever we form a chemical bond, that takes the input of energy. So there is a form of potential energy stored, as it were, in that bond. So when we break the bond, we release the energy. Form the bond, input energy, break the bond, release energy. And that's what we're doing in this case. So here's our structure of ATP at the top. There are three phosphates in a row and four negative charges. We say that these are high energy bonds. That is to say, we have repulsive forces because of those like charges. And it takes more energy to hold those atoms together than it otherwise would. They're repulsive forces. So when we break a bond, that releases energy. So in ATP hydrolysis, we're clipping off that last phosphate. So we're breaking that uh, phospho bond right here, and so we have ADP and inorganic phosphate as our products. Here's our water where we're hydrolyzing it. 
So when we break that bond we release energy and we can use that energy to drive certain processes. So you can think of ATP as kind of an er energy currency in the cell. In other words, I can take one form of chemical energy, use that to make ATP, and that represents some stored energy. Now since ATP is readily diffusible, I can send that anywhere in the cell and use that to spend, so to speak, for other processes that require the input of energy. As far as the high energy bonds, think of it this way. Imagine you have three individuals that absolutely hate each other and you've stuffed them all into the small little broom closet. How anxious do you think they'd be to get out of that closet? So that's our phosphate residues. Like charges, very repulsive of one another and so very anxious to get away from one another and that's why we release so much energy. We're going to return to this theme a little bit later. There is more to the story but we'll return to this a little bit later. Now with regard to the structural protein actin, you want to remember it's not static. It's very dynamic and so it grows and shrinks over time. Treadmilling is a case where we add and remove subunits at the same rate, so there's no net change, but it's still very dynamic. And the assembly and disassembly of these actin filaments is highly regulated. Cells can use this as a means of cellular motility, so they can extend and retract cellular processes. There's a nice picture here from your book. It's a crawling cell. Here's the leading edge on the lower left. Can you see the edges that are turned up a little bit? They've started to let go of that surface because they're getting ready to extend. They're building that actin filament and that's going to extend that process forward. The trailing edge you can see is still bound but it is able to disassemble the actin filament there and that retracts the trailing edge. So it's simply a means of motility. In the next lesson we want to look at tubulin and how it forms into microtubules. Now remember that's our largest structural protein but similar in many ways to actin but also very different and so it's interesting to compare those two together. And then so we'll look at the structure of tubulin and then we'll see its biological role.